So maybe you can so maybe. just try. So yeah, yeah. We, just, we, we should all sit here. Of course. No? I think we should all sit here. What do you think? We well, we the only trouble is, is that if you're sat there when someone's presenting, you can't see the presentation. Okay, so yeah. we want to, that's yeah. true. So we take the four first. But if there's, the yeah, we can take there and then we can, if we have yes. time for yes. questions, we can. Maybe so I stay sitting here just because I cannot see four. What? Four. Four.
So, I warmly welcome you to panel number two. And if you wonder if you sit in the right panel, we have two titles running. One is Challenging Collaborations in a Shifting Museumscape, and the other is Beyond the Innocent Museum. Both are right. So they were interchanged in, uh, in between. And I have a short announcement. We had five speakers, uh, two speakers withdrew uh, on short term, so we have a little bit more uh, time. My name is Marade Flitsch. I'm the director of the Ethnographic Museum at the University of Zurich, and I'm uh, the panel, panel organizer uh, in the name of the Museum Commission of the Swiss Ethnographic Anthropological Society. So the current title, Beyond the Museum, Innocent Museum, and now I, uh, Swiss ethnographic museums in exchange with source communities. Just as a small introduction, the time of mu innocent museum, museum innocence is out. We decolonize, we reconnect, reconnect, we critically reflect our collections. We collaborate with or original communities and their descendants. This is what currently occupies museums and communities in Switzerland, in the German-speaking world, in Europe, worldwide. Uh, it is about jointly uh, determining rel relevant research questions and develop joint collaborative research agendas, a point which has not yet arrived at the funding institutions, but I hope which will arrive there, that we need much more flexibility in topics because we need to de develop research questions jointly. In our panel, uh, I have to say we had a, a more people who would have liked to speak. We just had too short time. So we have five colleagues who give insights into their projects. I have to say Paul Basso will give a keynote to our panel. I invited you to uh, a keyn uh, for a keynote. And we, as I said, we have some more colleagues who would have liked to uh, speak. And we will discuss if this is uh, enough for a, maybe a topical um, um, publication of, a, of, of uh, within Sansa or which is now, which uh, now changed the name, but should just publish it somewhere. I think maybe it uh, will be worthwhile. So I, I invite as first speaker, Paul Basso. He is new, really very recently, uh, Hertz new, the new Hertz Professor of Global Heritage from the transdisciplinary research area present past at the University of Bonn. And I think you will maybe say a little bit more. I'm short because I thought I have short time. And uh, you will start with the keynote, um, the Reciprocal Museum. So the floor is yours. Question Thanks mark. For coming. Question mark. Question mark. Or the fame of Edo. I tried to avoid Benin, but I'm afraid I, did, I didn't succeed. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me to the, uh, the panel. Great pleasure to be here and to be in this wonderful institute and museum. It's, it's, it's really remarkable and a, something one should treasure. Um, I'm not quite sure what the distinction of the keynote and the rest of it. We're all keynotes, aren't we? So. Um, anyway, it goes without saying, and I'll read because I thought I had to really keep my time down. So I've, uh, I'll, I'll read, but uh, you know, maybe I'll go off east a bit. So it goes without saying that the theme of this year's conference, give and take, is highly pertinent to the context of the Anthropological Museum, and especially so as uh, Maria has already mentioned in this in the present moment when questions of restitution return and repatriation are so uh, prominent. We can no longer avoid interrogating the circumstances in which museum objects were taken and what, if anything, so-called source or originating communities have received in return. The observation that in many societies the reciprocal practices of giving and taking a constitutive of social relationships has, of course, been a fundamental concern to, uh, of anthropology. But one of the reasons why exchange relationships have been such a perennial subject of anthropological research and theorizing is because the nature of exchange is no simple matter. 
As all first year students of anthropology know, every gift demands a return. To refuse to reciprocate a gift is to precipitate, precipitate an end to social relations. To refuse a gift or to return the same gift is similarly taboo. The circulation of gifts can be convoluted and indirect. But as Marcel Mauss long ago argued, the how, the spirit of the gift, finds its way back. Establishing the distinction between commodities and gifts, between alienable and inalienable things, was important in early anthropological research um, on exchange. I'm not telling you anything you don't all know here. But subsequent work has troubled this dichotomy. For instance, observing how things pass through different regimes of value, being in turn commoditized and decommoditized, and undergoing transformations in value as well as form. Anthropologists observe that gift exchange is rarely truly altruistic or even balanced. Rather, exchange is a calculative arena, a political arena, involving not only transformations in the value of things, but also the possibility for the transformation in the status of the exchange partners. Through giving objects that have already acquired fame through circulation, the fame of the giver is extended in time and space, as argued famously Nancy Mann in her restudy of Kula Exchange, the, the fame of Gower. The fame of Edo, of Benin City, has also been extended in time and space through the circulation of its extended, uh, sorry, its, its looted artworks. Across Europe and North America, these treasured possessions are being circulated once again through digitization, noting the, uh, the launch of the wonderful digital ben Benin resource in Hamburg just last night, for instance, and increasingly through forms of restitution and return. These objects were emphatically not gifted in 1897, nor were they purchased as commodities, though of course they subsequently entered the art market. But here I'd like to reflect on what we might learn about the taking and giving of the Benin bronzes, and I'm thinking specifically of the bronzes through the anthropological lens of exchange. Scenes like these, audiences with the Oba, and his representatives, uh, agreement signing ceremonies, performance by members of the Edo diaspora are becoming increasingly familiar. This one, marking the transfer of legal title to 29 bronzes to the Nigerian state at the Smithsonian Institute, Institution Museum of African Art, placed just a month ago. I'm conscious here of the multiple and often ambiguous roles that anthropologists play in such debates. They may in turn be cultural analysts, advocates, activists, and so on. And we heard in the previous panel here uh, some discussion around these terms. Each position is differently entangled in the politics of restitution. But I'm concerned that the analysis of complexity has been painted as an unethical and even neo-colonial practice in this context. In relation to theories of exchange, Dan Hicks in the British Museums is fierce in his attack of Apagerais and Kopitoff's essays in The Social Life of Things and Nick Thomas's book Entangled Objects, accusing them of stifling discussion of colonial violence and holding back dialogue and action on cultural restitution. Yet Hicks makes no attempt to engage with the complex arguments of these works, which are not, of course, directly concerned with the Benin context, reducing them instead to conservative tropes of inaction. Through such strategies, the politics of restitution is framed in simplistic black and white terms as one of victims and perpetrators, reinforcing familiar racialized tropes of Africa and Africans as perennial victims. Thinking about the Benin bronzes through the anthropology of exchange complicates such narratives, but also reintroduces African agency into these power relations. After all, the story of the bronzes is one in which Edo, not Europe, was often the more powerful exchange partner.
Turning to the Smithsonian Institution signing ceremony, let us first note that the fame of the museum is also at stake in this calculative return. Thus, in an interview given after the signing ceremony, the secretary of the Smithsonian Institution, Ronnie Bunch III, reveals the reputational gains resulting from the restitution of the bronzes. And quoting here, people around the world are going to say, are going to say, he stated, these are the institutions that have treated us fairly, and these are the ones that have not. There was, however, one group that did not regard the Smithsonian return as fair. The New York-based Restitution Study Group sought an injunction to prevent the Smithsonian from, quote, affecting its gifting to the Federal Republic of Nigeria's National Commission for Museums and Monuments of the 29 Bronzes. The grounds for seeking this injunction are made on behalf of the descendants of enslaved African Americans whom Europeans forcibly brought to North America. As the complaint explains, and I quote, many but not all of the Benin bronzes were crafted from metal ingots melted down from a currency called Manilas that European slave traders pay to the over of the Kingdom of Benin or to members of the Benin nobility in exchange for abducted and enslaved neighboring non guinea people. It goes on, in undertaking this purported ethical action of returning stolen property to its rightful owners, um, this is the claim continues, the Smithsonian has expediently, expediently bracketed the story of the Benin bronzes to have begun in 1897 and end happily with the transfer to Nigerian Africans on October the 11th, 2022. The group argues that the story actually begins in the 16th century with, quote, a much more important theft, that is the abduction and sale of innocent people and, their less, and the loss of their liberty and lives in exchange for the copper manilas, which were then transformed into artworks. This story, the complaint continues, cannot be undone or ended by the expedient return of the tra to the traffickers, the payments they received in exchange for sacrificing the lives of the ancestors of African Americans of Nigerian descent. Earlier in 2022, the Restitution Study Group sent letters to several European museums engaged in the Benin restitution debate, outlining the same argument. In the event, the District Court for the District of Columbia did not uphold the group's complaint and the transfer of ownership has gone ahead. The exchange of enslaved people for manilas and other commodities is not disputed. Indeed, it provides a classic example, supporting Kopitov's analysis in the cultural biography of things, of the multiple transformations of value um, commodities undergo um, in exchange, including how human beings can be traded as commodities, while commodities such as copper can be transformed into currency and currency can be transformed into supposedly inalienable valuables. The Benin bronzes themselves portray the fame of Edo, including its mastery of the trade with Europeans, particularly the Portuguese, and the place of Manilas, eco in the Edo language, as symbols of wealth and power. And this is the classic representation of the, uh, the Portuguese, and you can see uh, the Manilas um, very clearly in these, uh, in these uh, flags. Interestingly, uh, an image of uh, Manila's um, is, uh, it continues to be uh, represented in Nigerian uh, currency, the 100 Naira note here. And indeed, among the treasures plundered from Benin during the punitive expedition of 1897 were many Manila's. As the catalog entry for this example in Berlin notes, the Oba could charge between 20 and 50 Manilas for a single enslaved person. Ten thousands, um, tens of thousands of them were traded by the Portuguese alone. Do such objects not support Nick Thomas's arguments that we need to attend not only to the European appropriation of, in this case, African things, but also the African appropriation of European things in understanding the local meanings of such objects as well as the power relations negotiated through their exchange. What status 
do such objects have today? Is it so black and white? Extending the object biography and the temporal bracketing as the restitution study group proposes reminds us that the Benin bronzes are implicated in the so-called triangular trade of people and things, and people as things, between Europe, Africa, and the Americas. It's interesting to note that the word Manila comes from the Portuguese word for both bracelet and manacle. And these iron manacles were collected by the colonial anthropologist Northcote Thomas in 1909, just 12 years after the sacking of Benin City from the territories conquered by the Benin Kingdom and from which the majority of those sold into slavery were captured. The one on the top from Uzeba is full sized, and this other one from Okpe is a miniature and is described as a charm, suggesting that the manacle, uh, like the Manila, has acquired a kind of magical potency. <clears throat> Much of my own recent research, reconnecting with the descendants of communities documented in the ethnographic archives of Northcote Thomas, uh, his surveys in the early 20th century, has taken place in present-day North Edo and Delta State, areas that were colonized by and brought under the suzerainty of Benin for centuries. Just to give one example, um, so over here, this is a photograph taken by Thomas um, in, in 1912, for instance. This one example, um, it, you can clearly see the influence of Benin um, in the presence of the royal insignia of the Adder and the Eben. Um, this is uh, a place called uh, Ubuluku in the Igbo speaking area of Anioma. The town is said to have been occupied by the retreating Benin army during the kingdom's expansion towards the Niger River. The point is that the question of victims, perpetrators, and agency looks very different depending on whose perspective one adopts. From Anioma, Benin was an aggressor slaver state. And what happens if we follow the commodity chain further? Manilas are, of course, manufactured objects, objects manufactured specifically for exchange as currency. It is likely that the copper from the earliest Portuguese Manilas was sourced in Europe, but in the 18th century, this was increasingly displaced by copper sourced through colonial and trade expansion in South America, particularly in Chile and Peru, where some of the world's largest copper mines continue to operate. Copper ores were extracted in South America and transported to major centers of copper smelt of the copper smelting industry, such as Swansea in, in, in South Wales here. Um, and the copper ingot, uh, ingots were then transported to manufacturing centers such as Birmingham, where thousands of manilas destined for trade in West Africa were cast. At each step in this commodity chain, we find transformations in materiality, in form and value. And accompanying each transformation in this exchange network, we find forms of violence, extraction, exploitation and calculation. And this is the nature of entanglement. The argument that attending to object biographies and hence to the entanglements of these biographies in political, economic and symbolic parallelations is a means to avoid acknowledging colonial violence is, I think, misguided. It is precisely these kinds of um, power imbalances and injustices that such an approach can reveal. This is not to suggest that museums should not pursue the, resist, uh, the restitution of plundered artworks to Africa. In the case of the Benin bronzes, it may be legitimate for beneficiaries of such acquisitions to bracket the taking and giving um, from the period 1897 to the present, as the restitution study uh, society group uh, assists has been done. But this needs to be done in the context of a wider ethical debate, which acknowledges the complexity of other power relations bound up in these works and the material journeys which they embody. It seems to me that this openness is essential to the new relational ethics that Sarr and Savoir propose when they refer to reactivating the concealed memory of such objects and the promise of a new economy of exchange that such reactivation might make possible. 
In such a project, one should not ignore the concealed memories that complicate a seemingly straightforward moral proposition. With its vocabulary of attentiveness, recognition, acknowledgement and responsibility, relational ethics is granted in the philosophies of Nell Noddings and Emmanuel Levinas and others. Putting face-to-face -face relationships at the heart of ethics, their concern is also with the fragility of ethics, its frustrating ambiguity in the midst of a desire for absolute ethical imperatives. Thanks. Thank you very much, Paul. We decided to first have all um, lecturers given and then uh, have a joint uh, discussion. So, next speaker is Renata Colombo Dugut. She is curator of Oceania at the uh, Musée de Topographie de Genève, a museum currently impressively in an impressive transition, and she will speak on collaborative projects at the MEM, take and give collaborations between museums and source communities at the Musée d'Ethnographie de Genève. So the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Thank you. I have to understand how to do. Okay, I got it. I decided to, 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 to give this title, Tate and Give, because I think that there are two different phases uh, um, that we have to analyze. The, the objects were taken, and in a certain sense, objects or something else will be given, or is going to be given. So, this is the Musée d'Ethnographie de Genève, is a place where I work, the new building. It's a museum which has been founded officially in uh, 1901, but the collection arrived uh, almost two, two uh, centuries before. This is part of the permanent display. And um, we can say that um, in general, like in Geneva, like in many other ethnographic museums, uh, uh, most collections uh, have been gathered in the last two centuries with the underlying conception to bring together the material heritage of colonized people that were considered as vanishing. Collecting was a one-way relationship resulting from colonial inequality. Artifacts and ancestral remains with their contextual information were taken away from the communities to be preserved in museums. So as we know, many objects, some objects were stolen. If you talk with the visitors of the museum, sometimes they have the impression that all the objects were stolen. You can be reassured it's not the case. Huh? The, many objects were also acquired in asymmetrical exchange, as a matter of fact. But I think that uh, it's, um, it's uh, unfair to generalize and to say that every object was taken in, in, in asymmetrical uh, exchange, because in this way, um, we reduce all the source community to simple victims. Uh, in, in some cases, for example, um, in New Zealand, the Maori exchange what they have, uh, uh, the, the most precious ancestral remains, the Toimoko, because uh, they wanted to fight against the colonizers. So in this exchange, uh, um, they were not victims, but they were trying to 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 fight against colonizers. And in many other cases, uh, uh, objects were exchanged also because people wanted to educate the Western uh, collectors about their culture. So I'm not saying that this is always a truth, but I think that's some, something that we have to, to, to consider. So I've just said a few things about the take. Now let's go to the give. Mm -hmm which is, um, it's not black and white, but it's, there are different forms of, of uh, uh, there are different colors of you. So I, I, I would like to speak, first of all, of the, of the, uh, of the physical restitution. Um, in, in Geneva, <clears throat> since the end of 19th century, at the, uh, in, in the Musée Archéologique, which was an ancestor of the Ethnographic Museum, 
the, there was a, a, a toy moko, a, a hat, a, a tattoo hat of a, a Maori chief. I, I'm not showing the, the, the Maori hat because the Maori don't want it. So it's, it's because of it, it's a, it, it's a, a uh, the practice that you use. So you can see uh, um, in this uh, image, in this photograph, uh, um, a, a Maori chief with all the tattoos. Um, the, the, the head, uh, the toy moko, um, um, were preserved in two different ways. So there were two kinds of, of uh, preserved heads. The preserved heads of uh, uh, ancestor. Uh, but they were also the preserved head of enemies. Uh, so it was a way to, 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 to acquire the mana, the power of the, of the enemies. So in New Zealand, there was a, a, a huge uh, market of the, of the toy moko, or moko mokai, where they are um, uh, head of a slave. Um, so in uh, many, 30 years ago, um, uh, the director of, uh, of the Musée National de Nouvelle-Zélande, which then became the uh, Te Papa Longarela, came uh, to, to Geneva, uh, to Europe, to uh, look uh, for uh, uh, ancestral remains. And he came to Geneva as in Basel or in, I don't know, in, in, in Châtel, you didn't have, so he came. And uh, he asked for the restitution of the, of the, of the toy moko. Um, so these are the official lecture in 1992, the, uh, the toy moko was uh, uh, given back to, 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 to New Zealand. Uh, then it was not given back officially, it was a, a permanent loan. Um, there, are, uh, there was a lot of mistakes, not no mistakes, of, uh, the, the head in a certain sense was uh, uh, forgotten by the Exomorphy Museum, but also by the uh, museum in New Zealand. In, 19, in 2009, we received a letter saying, do you have a toy moko? And we said, yes, you have the, the head. And so the, the discussion began again. And there was a, a um, in the 2014, it was an official uh, restitution. Uh, I always, when I speak about the, this, uh, this uh, ancestral remain, I say that it was a restitution without relationship. Uh, in, in other cases, we have a lot of relationship without restitution for the moment. So this is an example to give back physically, but it's not the only possibility. Um, in Geneva, we have a, a very important collection of uh, engraved bamboo from New Caledonia. Uh, this is the second most important collection all over the world. Um, and uh, they are wonderful. Uh, bamboo uh, tubes on which uh, um, the, the Kanaka um, engravers grave uh, carved uh, uh, um, stories, uh, history, and uh, there was a very important object, uh, so you can see some images. Uh, what I like most of this object is that the, the Kanaka didn't only represent uh, the, the, their rites, uh, their uh, rituals. Uh, this, for example, is a bamboo which is in Geneva, which uh, represent uh, all the different uh, um, 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 phases of uh, uh, yam and taro cultivation. But the Kanaka were also able to represent the uh, colonizers. And the details are very, very impressive. For example, here you can see a scene of uh, alcoholism. Huh? So they were graven between uh, 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 till uh, um, 1917, uh, then in New Caledonia there was a, a very uh, the, um, uh, hard period with a lot of uh, with the second uh, rebellion, and uh, so it was a, a very big decline in the Kanak society. So this is uh, the ancient director of the Musée de Concrete de Genève, uh, Marguerite d'Oxygène de Bach. As she was so passionate for this bamboo that she became the 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 specialist. So she, she was never in New Caledonia, but at that time she could get the engraved bamboo from all over Europe uh, and uh, she copied them. Uh, and so now we have uh, uh, more than 100 uh, copies of bamboo, which are very, very important. So in 2008, I organized an exhibition in Geneva on engraved bamboos. But two years later, two years later, yes. Uh, 
the exhibition was reorganized in New Caledonia. So this is also a form of giving back. And uh, for example, this is uh, uh, Micheline Peron, uh, who is uh, an artist, because the, the technique of engraved bamboo was uh, uh, rediscovered in, in the 80s, and she's one of the most important um, uh, artists. So this was the exhibition in New Caledonia, uh, with a ceremony for the opening, and with the Kanaka, we were looking at uh, their heritage, which uh, had been uh, taken away. This was yesterday. I had a, 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 a Kanaka artist in the collection who came and studied the, the, the objects. But I think that we are here in Neuchâtel, and we have to, to remember one thing, that uh, for, for New Caledonia, and for all the discussion about the uh, restitution, Neuchâtel and this museum is very, very important. Um, for um, Jean-Marie Chibaou, um, who was a, a, a Kanak leader, um, 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 encouraged uh, um, uh, anthropologists and curators of museums to make a sort of inventory of all the objects uh, uh, from, Kanak, from New Caledonia who were dispersed in, 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 in museums. So, so now they have a wonderful database which will be online uh, uh, in a few months from the Museum of New Caledonia. Um, in the, with the inventory of this, what is called le, le, le patrimoine dispersé, dispersed pet heritage. And uh, um, a part of, of this uh, work uh, um, um, uh, was, uh, uh, as a part of this work, uh, in, uh, 18, in 1992, an exhibition was organized in Paris and then in New Caledonia. And Emmanuel Casarero, who is now the director of the Musée du Quebrandi, um, um, realized that here in Musée de, uh, de Neuchâtel, there is a, a tête de monnaie, a Kanaka um, currency, uh, uh, who is uh, fantastic, uh, who is very important and who is uh, um, connected with his clan. So when he had a lot of discussion in, in, the, in, uh, in New Caledonia with the, with the, with the leaders, um, and he said, uh, how can we, how can, what are you supposed to do? Are we supposed to, to, to ask these objects back? But it is so important that if it has been given to uh, Lenar, it means that there was something which is important. How can we undo something without knowing how it was done? How can we untie a relationship without knowing how it was uh, um, done? So the Kanak developed this idea of objet ambassador. So the objects that went away from New Caledonia didn't, uh, not an absence. They are objects who are working for the Kanak culture all over the world. They are like ambassador of the Kanak culture, and but and this is the particularity of their uh, demarche is that from time to time they have to go back at home to 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 take strength again. So in a certain sense, the exhibition before uh, this one, this was uh, um, um, a step uh, um, uh, of of this process in which the objects went back to take strength again. So this is a, a, a way, a, ve a very important way of collaboration. I think that this uh, at the beginning of the afternoon we we, are, we heard what is a different um, definition. What is a museum? I think the museum is also a bridge, and uh, uh, that we as curator we also have to to work uh, to act as bridges. In um, two thousand seventeen, I organized an exhibition. Uh, on uh, indigenous Australia, the boomerang effect, and I invited, uh, um, I, 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 um, I displayed this wonderful dugong bronze sculpture from uh, uh, an artist who is called Alex Tipoti, and I invited also him uh, for a conference, for a workshop, uh, to see the exhibition. And when he arrived, um, in the museum we, we had um, displayed a, a, a mask, um, coming from his, uh, he, he comes from Torres um, Island, uh, he's a Torres uh, Strait Islander, um, and this uh, mask, uh, who belongs to Barbier Muller, uh, is a fantastic mask which was collected in 1872. 
uh, so he he was looking for this mask mask for years. So my acting as bridge, uh, I don't know if I can say like this, was to contact the director of the Musée Marly, has to open because we, we have also to ask the permission to open the vitrines. So there are, there is a, a insurance and so on. And he 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 was had the possibility to 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 see to speak to 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 study. Uh, you can see with the, he, he looked inside uh, uh, with his telephone lamp. So I think this is also a form of, of give. Another form of uh, give back is uh, um, it's reconnecting. Um, in, in Geneva, we have uh, not a big collection uh, from uh, uh, Milingimbi, but uh, we have uh, almost 50 objects coming from Milingimbi, which is uh, uh, an island from northern Australia. And Milingimbi um, um, was uh, for uh, almost 50 years, for over 50 years, uh, a prolific center of artistic creation. There was a Methodist uh, um, um, uh, mission. Um, and um, Milingibi was also a place where a lot of objects were created uh, because of the income, but also because it was a way for the for the for the young to 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 educate the the um, uh, the missionaries and 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 the Western buyers of of the collection. So there was a project um, um, by Louis Hamby and Lindy Allen. Um, uh, to make an inventory of all the objects coming from Ilingimbi uh, um, held in different museums. Um, there are 52 institutions worldwide holding Ilingimbi objects. And uh, well, there was a lot of things uh, which were which organized. But uh, I, about Geneva, um, I have to say that uh, um, two uh, artists uh, um, from uh, um, Milingimbi, Helen Ganal Riwi and Ruth Namalkara, came in uh, 2018. He, she start, they started the collection. Um, they went also to Basel and uh, perhaps to other museums. A few images. And then uh, in 2019, uh, I went to to to, to Milingimbi with my colleague Beatrice Warol from uh, from Basel, and uh, uh, all the information about the objects from Milingimbi, from Geneva, were all of the information were given. So they have a database with access, uh, uh, which is uh, um, not not a, a access also for some people, uh, and they have all the information. And then there was also discussion about the, uh, because in Geneva we have two um, um, decorated, two painted skull from, uh, from, uh, from, uh, from Ilingimbi and in Basel there is also one. So we had a lot of discussion about uh, the possibility of restitution. Then there is for me another way to, to, to give back. It is uh, to, uh, museums are also arena for discussion. Um, in, when I, in 2017, I organized this exhibition, Lepe Boomerang, I invited a, um, a contemporary artist um, from indigenous Australia, Brooke Andrew, and um, um, he was invited, first of all, to discuss about, uh, I, I wanted him to, to, to show some, to, to talk about the fact that uh, how, can you, how, how can we talk about some objects that we are not allowed to to show, but then there was a lot of discussion, and finally, the project became completely different. But uh, uh, he, uh, so he had a, a, a big space at the end uh, of the exhibition, but it also uh, intervened uh, in 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 the exhibition. For example, in in this part of the exhibition, I explain how the collection had arrived in Geneva. And uh, can you see this hat? Yeah, of course you can. Uh, this is uh, an intervention by him. So in this, the narrative that I had uh, was that uh, in the 60s, the Museum of Geneva exchanged with the Museum Victoria, fantastic collection. So we got fantastic objects, uh, which were displayed there. 
And he decided to put this, which is a very kitsch object, because he said in the same time, at the same, in the same period where in Geneva you, you received wonderful objects from the uh, indigenous Australia culture, in Australia, we Aboriginals, we were submerged with kitsch representation of ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was, a, uh, he called this intervention fuselage, so it, it, a different way to, 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 to interpret our different stories. Um, uh, he proposed also four interviews uh, um, explaining why uh, ethnographic museums should accept uh, the, the, um, uh, the protocols, the laws of uh, uh, indigenous Australia. And then I, I so this was also, uh, the blue vitrines are the museum discourse, uh, but in, in the middle there is his own discourse, huh? his own narrative. And then I want to finish with this. Uh, this was the last thing that the visitors were able to see in the exhibition. And uh, this is Brooke doing, so you can read the you, 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 written, uh, I think, 20 uh, times. Then uh, you cannot see, but it was written, because you in English means uh, you one person, but you also you several person. In French, we have tu et vous. So in a certain sense, English is, uh, could be defined uh, as a, um, less unprecise, but the Wiradjuri, so the language of the uh, indigenous, uh, um, the, the indigenous language of, of Bruca, there are 20 different ways to see you, because it depends of the relationship between the speaker and the one who, who is listening. So it was a wonderful way to see, to raise the question, who is, what language is primitive or is most primitive? <laughs> Thank you very much, Roberto. So now the next speaker is Larissa Tigimbasi. As you cannot easily Google her, I will say some <laughs> a little bit more. Not yet. <laughs> Larissa um, Tigimbasi is a young researcher in African studies. Her from Geneva, she's feminist, anti-racist activist, mm -hmm. is concerned with the place of minority min uh, narratives in histories. And she is uh, a member of the BIPOC uh, group, Decolonizing Spaces uh, of Transmission of Knowledge, and reports from her recent research, provenance research in colonial context, what stories to retrace. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, Peut-être tu le copies encore une autre fois. Non? Ouais, je vais prendre. Je suis désolée, je vais prendre. Ma... Want to use your own computer? I have an adapter for Thank you. Okay. Well, okay. 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 Uh, je vais parler en français. J'espère que ça ne dérange personne. J'ai fait mon PowerPoint en anglais, donc uh, <laughs> je pense que vous allez arriver à me suivre. Donc, euh, je, je m'appelle Larissa Tikimbasi. 
Euh, merci pour la présentation. Euh, donc, euh, je me considère comme une personne héritière euh, des dégâts de la colonisation. Je me considère comme afro-descendante. Et, et puis euh, aujourd'hui, euh, je vais essayer de vous parler d'un projet de recherche que j'ai fait autour d'une collection euh, qui a été ramenée par euh, Louis Eger. Et puis, puis euh, je vais vous présenter aussi euh, quelques initiatives décoloniales qui seront en lien avec euh, mes questionnements. Ok, donc euh, ici, enfin, cette photo représente euh, ma première rencontre avec euh, les collections de Proethnographica. Je ne sais pas ce que vous voyez, mais en tout cas, moi, je vois deux femmes, une femme blanche, une femme noire, nous tenons toutes les deux des armes, et une troisième personne qui porte aussi une arme et un bouclier. Donc sur la photo, on est toutes les deux très gênées, Anne Mayor et moi. Euh, moi, je suis gênée parce que j'ai l'impression qu'on instrumentalise ma présence pour recréer des images qui sont déjà dans nos imaginaires. Et puis, en fait, euh, je ne sais pas du tout quoi faire. Enfin, C'est par politesse que j'accepte euh, de me mettre en scène ainsi. Mais sur cette photo, je vois aussi deux femmes qui tiennent des armes. Et puis, euh, moi, dans ma recherche, c'est vrai que je me demande quelles sont les, les armes pour faire de la recherche de provenance. Donc, je vais présenter Eger, qui est celui qui a ramené la collection euh, d'objets euh, dont je me suis occupée pendant une année. Donc, Eger, c'est un marchand fribourgeois, euh, un bourgeois aussi, qui, a, enfin, à 20 ans, dé décide de partir euh, dans ce qui était les rivières du Sud, qui est en fait un territoire euh, qui est aujourd'hui la Guinée-Conakry. Et puis, il est engagé par euh, la CFAO, la Compagnie française euh, d'Afrique occidentale, pour faire du commerce et établir... Euh, un réseau de succursales pour faire euh, de l'import-export. Donc, il collecte des matériaux euh, naturels dans, en Afrique de l'Ouest et puis euh, revend des, ma des marchandises que euh, la compagnie pour laquelle il travaille euh, en, en exporte là-bas. Et puis, bah, là-bas, il se marie avec une Anglaise et puis euh, cette femme, Hélène Egar, va donner naissance à Auguste Egar, toujours euh, en Guinée française. Et puis, en en fait, Egar s'établit en Guinée française à un moment très précis qui est hyper important dans l'histoire de la mise en place de la colonisation française. Donc ça, c'était pour vous donner un aperçu euh, de la collection qui est très hétéroclite. Euh, il y a à la fois des chapeaux, enfin, des textiles, des épées, beaucoup d'armes. Enfin, cette magnifique arme euh, là-dessus, des couvre-plats, des calbasses, des jeux, des sandales, des instruments. Et puis, ce qui est nommé dans l'inventaire enfin, comme étant des bâtons de circoncision, je ne sais pas trop ce que ça veut dire, euh, et puis des plantes. Euh, mais vu que la collection date du 19e siècle, bah, les plantes sont un peu euh, racistes, du coup. <rire> Donc, euh, moi, mes questions de recherche, c'est... Euh, Alors, bah, je me demande quels sont les instruments pour penser l'histoire sociale des objets coloniaux Comment on fait pour retracer l'histoire d'une collection lorsque toute l'histoire n'est pas écrite, lorsque tout n'est pas écrit sur les archives Comment raconter l'histoire de celles et de ceux qui ont possédé, manufacturé les objets euh, que vous avez vus précédemment Et puis, pouvons-nous réintroduire ces voix-là à partir de preuves coloniales Donc, ma perspective, il faut que je la situe parce qu'elle euh, est au croisement de plusieurs choses. Euh, ma recherche est hyper influencée, bien sûr, par euh, bah, mon afrodescendance. Donc, c'est-à-dire que je porte un regard très différent sur les objets que je vous ai présentés. Euh, elle, a, elle a été aussi euh, nourrie par des expositions, notamment le travail de Denis Murel, qui a, qui a écrit le livre « Posé ». Modernity et qui a donné ensuite lieu euh, à l'exposition Le modèle noir de Jericho à Matisse au musée d'Orsay. Et puis il a été aussi nourri par une exposition en 2020 au euh, Palais de Rumine, exotique, retracé, euh, regardez l'ailleurs en Suisse, et puis une autre exposition, retracer la provenance, toujours au Palais de Rumine. Et puis bah, moi j'ai des, des, euh, des instruments anti-racistes. C'est-à-dire que je lis énormément 
de théorie décoloniale antiraciste. Et puis, bah, toute cette bibliographie que vous voyez là euh, m'a aidé à regarder les objets, m'a aidé à approcher mon objet de recherche. Et puis, ici en Suisse, je situe ma recherche euh, à côté de la recherche de Claire Brison, de Noémie, Mich de Noémie Michel, euh, de Noémie Etienne, et puis aussi de Jovita de Santos Pinto. Donc, pour retracer un peu rapidement l'émergence de la recherche de provenance, je pense que vous êtes tous un peu familiers avec ça, mais euh, enfin, moi, j'ai étudié le débat politique. Du coup, euh, je vois qu'en 2018, enfin, en 2018, il y a l'apparition d'un débat euh, au Parlement où plusieurs motions sont déposées et appellent le... Enfin, la fête, le, 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 le <rire> Le gouvernement suisse à prendre en compte euh, ces questions coloniales et puis de donner des, enfin, des armes, en fait, euh, que ce soit humaines ou financières, pour aborder ces questions-là. Et puis, c'est qu'en 2022, en fait, que l'Association suisse de recherche de provenance et puis l'AMS vont produire ce qui est la première, euh, enfin, le premier livre qui aide enfin, les chercheurs à, enfin, à, à faire de la recherche de provenance, selon moi. Et puis, bah, en octobre 2022, l'Office fédéral s'est prononcé sur euh, son désir de donner beaucoup plus de soutien euh, pour la recherche de provenance sur les objets coloniaux. Et puis, moi, il y a quelques... Enfin, ce débat, il est, il est structuré par plusieurs choses, à la fois le débat politique, à la fois les discussions comme vous, enfin, moi qui parle beaucoup et vous qui m'écoutez. Et puis, euh, mais aussi des débats à la télé. Enfin, c'est un débat qui s'est popularisé beaucoup, mais qui est aussi pris par des activistes depuis bien avant enfin, la, la prise de conscience des institutions culturelles, selon moi. Donc, il y a deux semaines, j'ai invité euh, Jonas euh, Sébastien Landemann euh, dans une discussion que j'ai co-organisée avec euh, Samuel Bachmann pour euh, les African les Swiss Researching African Days, et où on a abordé euh, bah, enfin, des questions très diverses sur la décolonisation du patrimoine, comme euh, typiquement jeunesse qui travaille à rendre accessibles euh, les données autour des collections coloniales en Suisse, Alice qui travaille sur ce projet euh, Benin City, et puis euh, Léa qui, elle, questionne euh, les Blancs de l'histoire, euh, comment on fait quand euh, l'histoire n'est pas racontée. Donc, très vite, pour ma méthodologie, ben, c'est vrai que quand j'ai commencé la recherche de provenance, pour moi, c'était assez difficile de le faire. Mais j'ai décidé de retracer à la fois les trajectoires individuelles qui m'ont donné énormément d'informations, euh, la carrière des objets aussi, par, quelle, par quelles institutions les objets sont passés, et puis euh, de questionner aussi les archives, les, les archives coloniales euh, qui me donnaient beaucoup d'informations. Je pense que j'arrive à... À, 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 à me représenter d'où ces objets viennent en Afrique de l'Ouest. Euh, mais voilà, enfin, ces, ces archives ne me parlaient pas typiquement euh, des voix de personnes euh, qui m'intéressaient. Donc, euh, faire ce travail m'a permis d'apporter ma contribution à documenter euh, l'histoire coloniale en Suisse. Elle m'a aussi permis euh, de documenter la place de la collecte dans la construction d'un autre ici en Suisse, de documenter les stratégies utilisées par euh, les élites fribourgeoises pour euh, créer un capital social et puis euh, intellectuel, parce que pour moi, ces objets-là ici en Suisse servaient aussi à entretenir des relations. Typiquement, Louis Eger réussissait à, 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 à joindre des sociétés assez prestigieuses à Fribourg au travers le fait qu'il faisait des dons euh, à des musées, euh, au musée, au musée d'histoire naturelle notamment. Et ça m'a permis aussi de documenter la place qu'avaient ces objets dans une euh, écologie relationnelle en Afrique, parce que je me suis rendu compte que les objets structuraient aussi l'échange commercial. Donc là, vous voyez des, enfin, des, des euh, photos de Louis et Gare. Je ne sais pas exactement qui sont ces personnes, parce que sa descendance n a, n a, ne réussit pas tellement à les identifier. Mais moi, j'imagine que ça, c'est Louis Eger parce qu'il ressemble énormément au monsieur qu'on qu voit sur un avis mortuaire juste là. 
Et puis, j'imagine que ça, c'est Hélène, euh, sa femme et leur fils Auguste. Ok, donc euh, je vais revenir sur, enfin, sur ce truc précis d'outils. Comment on fait lorsque des histoires ne sont pas racontées et quels outils utilisez-vous pour euh, donner la voix à des personnes dont les archives ne parlent pas forcément bah, Moi, je trouve que les, les, les objets sont des diasporas. Pour moi, c'est toujours assez euh, paradoxal dès le moment où on parle de communauté source sans vraiment parler des, des descendants de ces personnes-là ici en Europe, parce que les objets comme les corps, comme les plantes ont bougé, et donc nos corps font aussi partie d'une diaspora enfin, qui, qui, qui est légitime de donner de la voix pour des, des questions comme la provenance, par exemple. Et donc, vu que je n'arrivais pas à interroger cette diaspora d'objets, je me suis tournée vers d'autres voix qui étaient les voix d'activistes ou de personnes qui, en fait, basent leur, leurs actions soit à donner de la voix aux voix de personnes afrodescendantes ici en Suisse, donc parce que les afrodescendants ont énormément de choses à dire sur comment décoloniser l'espace ou les collections, ou c'est des, des, des collectifs qui adressent le lait colonial bien avant que les institutions culturelles aient mis ça dans leur programme. Typiquement, ici, avec le collectif Afro-Suisse, euh, en 2009 déjà, on voit que ce collectif faisait des visites décoloniales de Genève où, ben, où il remettait en question ce, ce concept comme quoi la Suisse n'a jamais eu de passé colonial. Et puis, à travers les rues, les monuments, ben, eux montraient ces traces de cette histoire-là. Et puis, il y a aussi des espaces qui, donnent, qui, qui, qui veulent valoriser bah, tout le travail qui a déjà été fait par des personnes afrodescendantes et qui ne paraît pas tellement dans des curriculums très, très blancs, malheureusement, comme euh, Noircir Wikipédia, qui est un projet panafricain euh, mis en place par deux personnes afrodescendantes et qui vise à recruter des personnes afrodescendantes pour, en fait, augmenter, enfin, écrire plus d'articles sur des personnes euh, de la diaspora africaine ou des Africains. Puis, euh, il y a d'autres initiatives qui créent des espaces de discussion, pas en mixité choisie, mais vraiment très centrés sur ce que les afrodescendants ont à dire, comme la Black Box, qui est un espace qui est à la fois mobile, permanent, qui change de forme en fonction euh, des, euh, des, euh, <coughs> des, des, des événements enfin, que la Black Box veut, veut accueillir, mais toujours avec le principe euh, de vouloir questionner l'héritage le, le, colonial, le white saviorism, le racisme et la violence contre les personnes noires. Et puis, la dernière initiative dont j'ai envie de vous parler, c'est euh, istnoir.ch, qui est euh, une, euh, une initiative de Jovita de Santos Pinto et qui donne de la place aux femmes noires qui ont participé au débat public euh, ici en Suisse en documentant en fait leur identité. Donc ça, c'est différentes manières d'aborder la décolonisation, à la fois en créant des espaces, en archivant le travail des personnes noires et en le visibilisant, et puis aussi en adressant le racisme et le leg colonial à travers les espaces enfin, dans lesquels on navigue tous. Et puis la dernière que j'ai envie de vous montrer, c'est... Une, une initiative qui a été faite à la fois en 2020 et en, deux, non, en 2021 et 2022 et qui, adressait, enfin, qui a été envoyée euh, à des espaces d'art qui avaient mis le, le carré noir durant euh, Black Lives Matter. Et c'était en fait pour les obliger à, à répondre à nos questions déjà et puis aussi à, à, à leur montrer certains points et voir si, enfin, si ces points étaient, euh, comment dire, si en fait ils répondaient à certains critères de décolonialité parce que c'est bien beau de mettre un carré noir si en fait dans les faits on n'est pas du tout effectif. Donc cette initiative-là, celle-ci c'est de 2021, oui, euh, donne des, des, 
des, des, des, des, des réponses, en fait. Elles donnent des outils, que ce soit à des institutions euh, qui, qui disent qu'ils ont envie de décoloniser. Euh, je, je vous laisse lire parce que ça parle de, de soi-même, mais enfin... Et puis, il y a aussi une autre slide. Voilà. Donc, euh, ma conclusion par rapport à ma présentation, c'est que la, la recherche de provenance m'a amené à retracer énormément de trajectoires à la fois les trajectoires personnelles de familles, des institutions de Fribourg, mais aussi la vie sociale des, des objets en eux-mêmes. Et puis, bah, j'avais vraiment envie de donner beaucoup plus de place au contexte africain parce que pour moi, dans les objets coloniaux, il est hyper important, mais j'ai eu beaucoup de peine parce que travailler sur des, des archives coloniales, bah, ça a forcément des billets. Enfin, voilà. Et... Et puis, moi, je voulais terminer aussi euh, en disant aujourd'hui, typiquement, dans la salle, je suis, je ne sais pas s'il y a des personnes racisées, mais en tout cas, on, on est deux personnes que j'identifie comme étant noires. Et puis, euh, ben, je voulais vous poser la question qui est en lien avec la politique de la voix, c'est qui est-ce qu'on considère comme étant des experts aujourd'hui Qui est-ce qu'on mandate et quelle place on donne dans notre pratique à la voix des afrodescendants parce que eux aussi font partie de ce débat. Voilà, merci. Thank you very much. So, as I said, Lise Bussel and, and Patrick who did Teresa. Uh, withdrew uh, shortly, withdrew their contribution. So the final lecture will be given by by Andrea Scholz <laughs> <laughs> from the Ethnological Museum <laughs> Berlin, where the permanent exhibition of the Humboldt Forum recently opened, also with contributions from Andrea Scholz. And she will give very fresh insights also with, from the context of this project into her ongoing research on Amazonian lessons on cultural belongings and gift exchange. Yes, I have to apologize. I did not put my presentation here. So you have to wait some minutes more. Second. Yeah, some seconds. And I have to apologize once more because I will present you something in a very uncooked stage. So. Uh, yeah, I had one hour more to cook it because of traveling with Deutsche Bahn, but actually it was not enough. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, uh, Okay, so I will try here. Uh -huh. I have to mirror. 
I think it's him. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, um, good evening. So I will talk uh, once more about the red national No, I. I have to apologize again. I had to wake up at five o'clock this morning, so my English is a bit tired. <laughs> as the rest of myself about the relationality of museum collections i will speak and uh, as we have heard from the other speakers it is a very popular topic right now in the field and i think we can uh, distinguish like two strands of this, the discussion on the one hand uh, we are talking a lot about the colonial past of the collections and the violence and issues of restitution and repair and reparation and on the other hand, we have a lot of discussions about shared cultural heritage and about all the, all the chances we can take from that and uh, chances for collaborative engagement like exhibitions, research, education programs and so on. I think uh, that both strands are kind of centered on humans and artifacts mainly. And uh, I'm working since 2014 in collaborations between the museum and indigenous people from Amazonia and uh, several partners with different backgrounds have repeatedly emphasized that this is a restriction which is really misleading because artifacts and people are part of much larger networks into which plants, animals, so-called spirits, ancestors, territories and so on are also integrated and have to be equally considered. So we must also take into, into account the enormous range of relationships from production to quasi kinship and uh, several notions of owner and mastership up to, from our point of view, crazy notions of predatory kinship relations. For those who are a bit familiar with ethnographic literature about Amazonia, this does not sound very new, I admit. But nevertheless, I think we working in museums generally, generally pay too little attention to these ideas both in our talking about and in our dealing with museum collections, certainly because of our own cultural conditioning, conditioning and uh, also in our practices. Hence, uh, my proposal is to widen our notion of relations, taking seriously what people never get tired to tell us. On the one hand, this helps us to reread also the history of our collections, trying to imagine the full range of relations the collectors were embedded in, and, and on the other hand, to envision more holistic forms of museum engagements. What I will present from now are experiences and ideas that are coming up in a collaborative project between institutions in Germany and Brazil and indigenous partners from two regions in the Amazon. In this project called Amazonia as a Future Laboratory, we are trying to address the challenge of thinking, practicing, and visualizing relations beyond humans and artifacts through analog and digital strategies. Um, as is usually the case, this project builds on previous projects and is based on so-called historical collections, the creation of which is also not separate from the networks that interest us. Therefore, I start my ref reflections from the past and I I will end up showing the first concrete results of the project if I have enough time. Based on very, very concrete and moreover very fresh experiences, I will also reflect on the role of museums as ex exchange partners in these networks and in which directions this role should develop from my or from our point of view. So uh, this is a map uh, which is um, shown in the storage of the South American ethnographic collections in Berlin, and it shows the so-called German expeditions to the Amazon. I will focus now on the red one uh, to the upper Xingu and on the green one to the upper Rio Negro. Um, first of all, I will talk about the upper Rio Negro collections from the mythical past to the future lab. So uh, this picture is the first one of a collection about the history of the whites painted by the Desana artist Feliciano Lana from the Upper Rio Negro. Lana's pictures, picture shows us from a Rio Negrino point of view that once indigenous and whites were bro brothers, they shared the same story of origin. But then due to the violent nature of the whites, which evolved during the first ayahuasca ritual, where the diversity of cultures and languages also originates, 
the whites were expelled and returned much later with Bibles, guns, and goods. This is a very long story of inter-ethnic relations that I will have to cut short here, concentrating on one personality who connected the Upper Rio Negro region with the Ethnological Museum Berlin. This is uh, Theodor koch grunberg <laughs> uh, And he collected, among many other artifacts, this uh, slit drum here. And it is, uh, yeah, it is um, part of the story how this slit drum become, became his own. Uh, this is a hand-drawn map from the um, koch grunberg uh, trip to the Upper Rio Negro. So uh, as you can see here, he traveled to many different rivers and he stood there for two years. This is one year longer than the normal field work for PhD projects. So this is quite a long time and I think he really got very related to the place and the people. And this is a picture from the Tipiaca um, waterfall, which is uh, quite close to a place where we are working right now. And uh, this is a place, uh, and this is a picture from Theodor Koch-Grünberg uh, drinking together with uh, people from the Upper Rio Negro. And I think it was especially in these kind of situations where he collected, when he collected a lot of the artifacts he, he uh, could take to, to uh, the museums, because it's very strange. From, the, uh, from today's point of view, that in the museums we store a lot of artifacts which are not kind of, which are not objects in the strict sense of the term. They are non alienable <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so um, this is uh, an important topic also in the in the project. And um, I have to really cut short the whole story because it's a long term engagement, but. Um, which started in 2016. And uh, first of all, the first trip was a trip uh, by people from the Upper Rio Negro, from the Colombian part to the museum. And then um, a long story of uh, projects and uh, engagements evolved, but uh, centering more and more on the place there on the territory, because this was really the desire of um, of the partners that they want to engage in in their place and this is a very exemplary picture showing me showing objects from berlin and them <laughs> producing artifacts which was really their interest and this is a, a picture we had seen many of them by uh, from roberta <laughs> people uh, visiting the Depot. So there was a lot of joint research also in the collections especially on the ritual items i i mentioned um, because the ritual items like the, the adornments and the paraphernalia of the chief we have seen in Lana's first picture are non alienable objects. Or they are not objects, they are considered body parts of ancestors. And the rattle lamps we can see here and we also saw in Lana's drawing is a representation of the cosmos and connects Upper Rio Negro people to their territories. So to cut another long story short, this requires special attention and imply, implies also a special responsibility as these items cannot be easily restituted because of their nature as body parts of ancestors and we really do not know who is the right ancestor so it's very complicated. And as I have been mentioning before in the last years we realized there were workshops in the upper in upper Rio Negro communities in Colombia and in Brazil with a focus on the production of artifacts, basketry and weaving practices, to Kano benches, artistic projects, and also at the end, the building of a traditional longhouse. So um, the focus of the last two years was really a processing of the audiovisual data stemming from all these projects and information in the future lab, especially during the pandemic, as we could not travel in this time. And the first concepts for digital tools are based on experiences in the Upper Rio Negro. So this is uh, one of the tools we are developing. It, is a, it looks very raw and it is meant as a really raw tool to connect digital entities in a semantic database. And um, digital entities are not only artifacts and people, but also production events, rituals, plants, and um, later on also places and yes I, I hope I will have time at the end to show you some more of that 
And then we are developing also two modes of um, showing these relations in exhibitions called the Wanderer and the Wonder Wall. They sound very similar. And uh, they are kind of coupling narration and exploration. So there will be a, a narrative which can be explored, but um, also um, an exploration which is narrated. So it's kind of it kind of matches. And these are the images of the first prototype. So <clears throat> the narration is is uh, based on or it's um, to, uh, it's um, narrated by by videos. And then at the same time, I can explore places and uh, artifacts and materials and also techniques and um, this is kind of coming together yes um maybe at the end i can show you the prototype so um next i would like to speak briefly about the upper shingu collections from the pacification of the whites to new confrontations um the uh <clears throat> there's this payment a trip by Karl von den Steinen, who was um, for the indigenous people of the Xingu, the first one they could pacify. So he's the, the, the one who um, they pacified him and then they pacified the whites. And she traveled there between um, first in uh, 1884 and then in 1887. And uh, there's a very strong oral tradition talking about Karl von den Steinen. This is very interesting. So he's called Carlosi in the Xingu. And um, it's interesting also because at the end of his trip, he changed names with one of the chiefs. And so there's still a clan called Carlosi. And uh, this name changing maybe for Carlosi, for Karl von den Steinen was kind of a funny story and he describes it in his book. But for the Xingu people, this is a very important event. So he cannot get out any more of the relation now. And that's why we cannot get out anymore of the relation with the Xinguanos. And uh, yes, so I will show you a bit more about the, yeah, this will not say anything to you as you don't know the region. Um, this is the picture, famous picture from the second Xingu expedition. So the one in the middle is Karl von den Steinen and the others are his travel companions. And, Maybe you see that, uh, yeah, you can see uh, the conditions they were traveling very long time by, first of all, uh, walking and then they could um, go by canoe. But uh, they traveled about three months uh, until they arrived really the upper Shigu region and then they had to get out because of the starting of the rain season. And uh, this is the famous travel companion of uh, Karl von den Steinen called the Bacardi Antonio. Now I, I get to know that Bacardi Antonio was not Bacardi, but Bauja. So the oral tradition of the Xingu says that he was not Bacardi, but he is remembered as the Bacardi Antonio. And this is a picture from his first um, encounter with the Nauhua, who today, um, which in um, Karl von den Steinen's case is like a synonym for all the Carib-speaking groups in the Xingu, and uh, they also they um, the Kuikudo, which are our partners in the current project, are also called Nauqua in the in the von den Steinen book. And there's a, a narrative by Karl von den Steinen how he meets the Nauqua for the first time, and then he arrives there, and they are very afraid, and they run away, and they hide their their, their women. And then he says, no, I'm peaceful, I arrive in peace. And there's a very <laughs> interesting story by an old Kuikudu man. Um, it was, um, it was um, aufgenommen, recorded, recorded, <laughs> recorded uh, kind of 10 years ago by Carlos Fausto. This person is now not among us anymore. And he's uh, telling the same story that Carlos here arrived and he said, peace and peaceful and I'm arriving in peace. So it's very interesting how this matches. And uh, yeah, this is the last picture of uh, a camp in the in the bush. And this is the first picture of our Shingu trip, which happened uh, this summer in 2022 after the very apocalyptic uh, dry season in Germany. And I was like, okay, now I can go to Brazil. Kind of a holiday <laughs> from this apocalyptic situation in Germany and the um, Humboldt Forum opening, which is also very stressful, and uh, which <laughs> happened then was also a very stressful trip. 
first of all, through this um, soil, soil desert, which is now surrounding the Xingu Park, which is a very huge indigenous park created in the 1970s by the famous brothers uh, Villas Boas. And um, it's very big. It's the size of Belgium, I think, Do you know, more or less. And um, yeah, and all the surroundings are like that. And it's very hot and very dry and very horrible. And then you enter the Xingu Park and it gets like this, it gets a bit more green. And this is uh, kind of the, um, <laughs> the next one from the bush picture I showed you from the Karl von den Stein um, photo collection, which is not from Karl von den Stein, but from another guy who was part of the exhibition. But uh, this is one of the famous landscapes in this area. So when we arrived at the Kuikudo village, the scenery was like that. Um, these villages are circular and um, all the houses um, are like big family houses. So not only one family, one nuclear family lives there, but an extended family. And there are two chiefs, one living on this side and the other one living on the other side. And in the middle is the famous man's house. So this is, um, considered uh, the center of the power of the village. And as you can see, it was very smoky because of the fires. And yes, this is uh, us presenting the, the project and what we wanted to do. The idea was to connect the Kuikudo people with the collection by Karl von den Steinen and to make some kind of workshop depending on they wanted to do also. And um, the first thing we did was this presentation of the trip and of the books and of the, the artifacts and so on. So the, this person is Mutua um, Meinaku, he's Meinaku, but he lives in the Kuikudo village and he uh, is a teacher, he's a school director. <laughs> and uh, then the community, community kind of took over. This was really interesting. The next day, nobody came to the association's house we saw in the picture before, but they met in the community house in the middle. And they started a workshop which we did not have any influence anymore <laughs> what would happen or what would not happen they organized themselves so on one part uh, the women sat down and they um, uh, wove um, mats from Burichi, and on the other side the men produced fish traps and um, they kind of instrumentalized us for uh, recording and um, recording by video and supporting their video collective and yes so this was very very nice we had not to do anymore so this is the picture of the gathering of materials so what we could record was the whole uh, process from the gathering of the materials also um, some interviews about the origins of, of uh, the artifacts and the, the owners the mythical owners of the artifacts and then these are the ready fish traps. Very interesting artifact. It's very complex to weave first uh, in the middle and then it goes like this. And this is the women again. Yeah, and what we all also did was uh, showing pictures again from the uh, Berlin collection and also a dictionary for, um, which was uh, the result of a former project by another museum, um, national museum colleague, uh, um, linguist Bruna Franchetto. So we, we could match um, the pictures from the museum with the dictionary which had a lot of uh, information in Kuikudo also and we uh, arranged like a small group of people who wanted to engage in that. And we could also record uh, the daily practices in the household um, and what they have in their houses, which was very interesting to me because compared to, to the upper Rio Negro, where many of these artifacts are not there anymore, they are only in the museum. In the Xingu houses, you can see everything. It's like, wow. But at the same time, uh, people were super concerned about uh, this is the Shinguru, the Kuikudo Video Collective. And uh, what they also expressed all the time was their concern about the loss of materials because of the fires. Because uh, as you can see here again, there were really heavy fires and all the, not only the bush, because it's normal that the bush burns, but then at the moment the bush burning stops and uh, the 
wood should not, um, the forest should not burn. But what was happening there was really heavy forest burnings. And uh, during several months or in the night, it was so hard to sleep because of the smoke and all people complained. And then happened a really uh, bad accident. A, a person died from the neighboring community and all the activities had to stop. So this is a picture of the super quiet village. It was spooky. And uh, yeah, a very hard moment because uh, they had to go all for the morning rituals to the neighboring community. All the people cried the whole day and, and all the smoke. It was kind of, wow, okay, very the end of the world. Uh, yes, and uh, this is a picture from above of the Shingu Park with the fires. And what we did at the end was also a small video about uh, what is happening there. And uh, the speaker is Taku Kuro, which is a famous um, indigenous filmmaker right now. And this video, this was a very nice story because this video kind of went viral and uh, caused a lot of um, resonance in Brazil and a lot of media echo. And in the very heated pre-election times, I think it was uh, a good idea to do this video. And then uh, this is the picture of um, when we were already at home. The indigenous fire brigades, they came together and they were kind of reflecting about the causes of the fire and why this could get so bad this year. Yeah. And and uh, what, which was really interesting as well and very good was that after the end of the morning, the community could resume the workshop and they ended what they had to stop because of the morning. And uh, yes, overall, this uh, Shingwood field trip was to me a quite shocking experience because of, uh, yeah, because of the situation in the Shingu Park as an island within this desert of soy and devastation full of smoke. But at the same time, it was a very interesting lesson also on, ex on exchange because of Carlos Faustus, who was on one of the pictures, it's a, um, a Brazilian anthropologist, uh, because of his long-term engagement in the field preceded by the linguist Bruna Franchetto and the archeologist Michael Heckenberger, the famous Michael, they were talking about him all the time. Michael, the community, Community did not lose time in, in, in the, I don't know, in kind of checking us out, but they at the moment instrumentalized us and for, they used our stay for their needs and their interests. So what was also very interesting was a very excessive gift exchange at the end. It was not a gift exchange because I gave my gifts at the beginning, like we do in Germany. <laughs> like um, when I arrive, I, I give my gift. And at the end, all the people arrived and they gave us a lot of gifts like this and this, things like that. I, I arrived packed at my home and it was very clear that uh, in, on our next workshop, they were expecting a lot more <laughs> as a return. So, it's, uh, yeah, the story of Carlos here is going on. Did you exchange names? <laughs> no, <laughs> still not. <laughs> Nobody wants to be Andrea there. So this will be more or less the next steps in the project, editing the videos that can be used in the workbench and wonder, wonder modes, and also putting the data from the dictionary and the new insights into the objects into the workbench. And then we scheduled a second community workshop at the Shingu because they said, it, this is only the first one, we have to do at least five. And the next one will be with more complicated objects. So there's an agenda set. And uh, yeah, and there will be also a workshop at the Upper Yoledo next year. So I think which, what is really interesting and very important after this uh, experience in the Shingu is that both workshops should take the situation in the territory more into account. Like uh, the story they told us all the time about the loss of materials through environmental degradation. This is something we can stop and cry, but I think it's also good to, or it's better not to cry, but to um, be really realistic and uh, kind of map these losses and really work mm -hmm. with georeference data and to be more, at least in Shingu, it's easy because there's this archaeologist working there all the time. They have a lot of georeference data in the Upper Rio Negro case. There's a 
collaboration with an NGO. They have also, they are working a lot in these mapping activities. So I think this is super important to engage in these kind of topics also at the museum. So I think we just take another 10 minutes. Shall we all go in front? And mm. Oh, God. Beyond the innocent museum, museums are no longer innocent places looking for opening up a collection for understanding alternative narratives which are in the museum. What, what me as somebody who has been working for a long time in the museum strikes so much is we think we open up the collection, we look at a map, and we are very often not aware that the map is a Western gaze. It represents a Western con concept of landscape and we have very few documents of alternative landscapes. We recently at our museum had a, a conference on um, on Sri Lanka, uh, where uh, the landscape understanding of the people was confronted with a Western map. One was really astonished how rigorous the colonial gaze uh, transported through maps is. Or uh, we speak of decentering Europe or decolonizing. Uh, museums and decolonizing our collections and decolonizing our engagement, but as um, Larissa uh, also pointed to, we lack alternative voices, we do not encounter them in, in part at all, we are not aware that these voices are lacking, and um, in the same time, the ethnographic museums and collections very often are the only places where one can construct or find voices if one reads collections against the grain, against the archives, against anything. And what I found also, what, what we encounter very often is when we have collaborative uh, uh, projects, I'm always fascinated how people understand very, very quickly how incomplete our collections are and how they try to catch up with giving us extra. We, we recently had an exhibition where we, uh, the people sent us from Bangladesh seven hours of film because they were the had the impression that our sound and film archive is very very incomplete and so and this is i think also something which is interesting and which where we can build on this being said i open the discussion uh, open the floor for, for your questions discussion is now what may, maybe could develop Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much for all the presentations. They were all really fascinating. Um, me now dealing with a museum with a strong historical collection, I'd like to ask you, Larissa, because I, I find this question really important. Can Florence research highlight the agency of African subjects and individuals? Um, because, I, and I think it comes from two points. First of all, there are indeed is voice lack of on the other hand i think it's also related to our methodology of project research and i think your hint to the afro descendant community and members was one way of approaching another perspective but i would like to hear from you did you also what kind of methodologies or um, ideas did you develop um, for your research to actually um, Yes. Were you able to identify individual actors? No. And do you think that's really just because the archives are void of it, or does it also have a methodological reason? Um, I'm aware that there is one book. I don't have the, the reference here, but I can share it with you. I have it on my laptop. I'm aware that there is this one book who gives ideas how to recreate 
those um, history. And I know that Jovita dos Santos Pinto, she recreates imaginary stories where um, there are lack of information. So she recreated, for example, with a slave, um, I don't remember her name, right now, but um, she recreated an, another story picturing her. And um, that's one way of giving, not giving voice. It's not that she, it's her voice, but it's one way of making somebody um, embody or I don't know how to say that to um, imagine. Yeah, imagine or to Occupy the space. Create yeah, create a presence. So that's one way. And um, for me, I didn't, I didn't get to know these people. So that's why I turned into other voices because I couldn't. There, the the archives were so stereotyped and with racial bias. I don't know how to say that in English. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I didn't. I didn't manage to to write their story, or I could. I could only face the fact that there were nothing on them. There in archives, it's always like, or the chief of something. But we know his name. We know his name because yeah, when when you read in like book stories and history history book, you have certain names at this at that period but in archives in Fribourg there were no name beside Egger's name even Helen she's not even nobody knows her but she's on picture so yeah mm -hmm. thank you I can contribute to this mm -hmm. um, from my point of view I think history is always negotiated so there's not one history there's no. not one version, there are many versions. It depends on who is narrating the story. And uh, I personally, I did uh, research in Uganda, in the west of Uganda, in the kingdom, with a huge collection. So all objects were brought uh, at the end of the colonial period into the National Museum to be kept there, and they abolished the kingship. And what was going on in the years 2000, that they gave, had to give back the objects, they re-established the kingship, and then there was a whole negotiation going on about these objects, and they were sort of reinvented, mm -hmm. and also their their histories, their narratives. So this is, um, I think, this is part of the challenge. Um, first of all, what you mentioned, mm -hmm. the context you can reconstruct the context, mm -hmm. but you cannot be sure it's the history exactly. Mm -hmm. But we can reconstruct the context with those people who are descendants of those whose names we know. Mm -hmm. And then we can, can come close to the history, at least. Mm -hmm. And that can be very interesting to also expose in an exposition and to, to present it as, as an imagination, how history could have been in an alternative way. Mm -hmm. That's a tool that I use, I mean, I'm not the only one using it, but like in black studies, the, the imagination is something to create things that are not name, nameless. So that's a tool that I use a lot as well, recreating something or reimagining something. And oral histories also. Oh, yeah. May I add something? Oh, no, perhaps to somebody. Mm -hmm. No, it's coming back to that history question. I mean, I feel that something that you do in your work is also to tell Swiss histories, right? I mean, to tell the histories of the bond runs and the to tell the histories of the discovery of the exotic. And maybe that's the story that comes from Edgar's work and not mm -hmm. necessarily trying to reconstruct um, histories from Yeah. From what's uh, well, I, I want to, I would like to add something about what you already said. You said. Um, um, sometimes I have the impression that the description, that the archives tell more about us or about more about the person who has collected the object than more than about the people who, who produce or created the objects. Um, if, if I, for example, describe some, uh, if I think uh, about some descriptions, uh, 
um, of, of some objects. And another thing, I think that um, um, we have also to, to think that uh, I always have the impression the objects speak. Uh, uh, that sometimes we can't hear what they say, but because we don't have the the the, the, the key. Is mm -hmm. interpretation, but there are other people who can help us. Mm -hmm. I work a lot with uh, with the source communities. Uh, for example, I work with Denis Porowa, uh, a Kanak uh, um, a poet about the, the, the bamboo gravé, mm -hmm. and he discovered things that I wasn't aware. And he discovered also, and he was able to name and to tell stories that that weren't told before. Mm -hmm. So I think that this kind of collaboration can also be important. Mm -hmm. um, so working in the archives, but also working with, with communities. Yeah, but the thing is, I feel like museums tend to work with communities on projects. There is this one project, so we're going to hire somebody who knows how to read this. And then we don't give them a position in our institution. Mm -hmm. For me, institution I have to create space for these people permanently, not just on project, because it's not a living, <laughs> you know? You're completely right, but you, you have to imagine when you work in a museum, you're not working with uh, one community, but no. you're working with 3,000 communities. Uh, but other so voices need to be, to be in the institution as well, other voices. Yes. Yeah. I don't know which voices, but other voices. I wanted to ask something which made. I, I want to order, order. Yeah. Do you want to respond? Yeah, to I question? would like to respond because I think it's a matter of uh, giving people space uh, according to their own conditions. It does not mean necessarily to create jobs for all the communities in the world because this is first of all not feasible, and then not everyone wants to live in in. No, okay. or in Geneva or wherever. But I think the, the important thing is that up to now, museums, at least from my point of view, tend to behave still like institutions of power and they define how things can be or should be executed. I think that's what you were saying, that uh, it's project based and higher and higher and who at the end decides is, is not the the power is not given to to other people to other voices let's call them like that. it's not exactly what i was saying for me it's a problem of the structure how do you create those spaces to to, to make other voices be just heard you know i mean it's a problem of structure i feel like if a lot of people here have a job in institutions some places can be made so that, odd, I don't know, it's a matter of imagination. If someone doesn't want to live in Geneva, we have Zoom now or a plane, I don't know. You travel all the way to a place. Why can't they travel all the way to Berlin? But there are a lot of things like, like what you're like you saying. It's not imagination, it's okay. already reality. But permanent not, position? Not permanent position, no. Okay. But, but uh, I mean, uh, uh, there's a lot of people coming from such community visiting our collection, and we sometimes we also pay for them. I mean, when they come, they... Luckily. Yeah. It's normal. I, yeah, yeah. Maybe. It connects to my next question. I wanted okay, to well. ask about the object as ambassador. As, but if I understand you well, you don't want to have ambassadors, but people who are permanently in a position uh, in museum. But being in a museum, to have your voice being heard, is something as being an ambassador to me. So it's not against what you're saying at all. So actually, I, I wanted to, to ask about the concept of objects as ambassadors. Can you explore it a little bit? So. Yes. So th this was a concept which was developed uh, um, in the 90s uh, uh, by Emmanuel Casarero, um, when he was preparing the return of these objects uh, from the, all over the world uh, for the, uh, the exhibition in New Caledonia. So the, the objects were exposed in, in, in Paris and then they went back to, to, to New Caledonia. And when he saw the, sorry, no, 
when he saw the, the la tête de Monet, you see, he said that it was so fantastic. So he discussed with with the with the with the leaders, with the uh, any I don't know how to say it, with the old people, with the with the leaders, and and uh, they developed this idea. They said we don't know why the object has been given, but if it, it has been given to Maurice Lenard, it was an important object. So we cannot untie what was created. We cannot. Uh, um, uh, undone, undo a relation which was created. I don't know if I... Just a point, you can see this object yeah. in, in the exhibition. In the exhibition. Uh, La Permanente des Choses, in the room called Embassy. Uh, you know, for... About, and there is this object and this discourse. Of yeah, uh, America's America. 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 But what, what is also important, sorry, in my other negotiations, uh, and discussion with people, no, I have stuff. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ellen reminded me. Oh, sorry. Remind me. She has to remind me. Uh, remind us of the time I would give a last, uh, a, a last but one. Well, mine was a question, though. So. Then I would have to have a final, final. Should uh, I not ask it? But, uh, <laughs> I, it was more of a question, though. So. Go ahead. Well, so one, I just wanted to follow on and say this is also an argument, the ambassador uh, idea of, that's used often by uh, people in Benin about the Benin objects and this, this notion of fame I was referring to. But my question actually, which you may not want me to ask, was to Andrea, which is you didn't really elaborate on this really interesting question about the relationality with the more than human. And I was because uh, in what you present it was uncooked. <laughs> it was too much. <laughs> you should have had another hour delay. Yeah. For that one. But uh, that I think there's a really interesting question, particularly because um, obviously in the material you presented, it was mediated through human actors. So it just opens up if we take you know other ontological possibilities yeah. seriously. What does that actually mean for us? Mm -hmm. Instance, you know. Yeah, and this maybe connects a bit also to the to what you said because this does not mean necessarily permanent jobs in a museum, but it means really uh, long term and a stable and a confident engagement of the museum there, and not only um, taking into account the people but also taking into account the territory. That's my point. <laughs> Okay, unfortunately, we have to finish up. I would like to um, come back to what I said in the beginning. And, uh, this uh, supports also uh, what you said. And I'm really firmly convinced that to a large extent, we ask the wrong questions because we have too few people with different voices in teams where this uh, questions are developed. We really, we go into a field, we say we have this collection and now we have these questions, could you please answer? And on that way, we skip the most important questions we could jointly, collaboratively develop. That is one of the insights of collaborative research, uh, which, uh, where, which we should really also herald to funding institutions. We have the wrong funding schemes. for the uh, for, we, we put wrong questions, uh, insufficient questions, and we have no money for what we really should do. So uh, this would be my conclusion. <laughs> 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 I propose this for a journal to Sansa, to ex-Sansa, to date whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>